Yes, they do. Excellent. What is up everybody? Welcome back to the channel and the third installment in my first five video series. The series that's insanely popular with people with short attention spans who don't like any task where there are more than five steps involved. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about the first five things that come to my mind when I'm setting up to do some benchmarking because that's what I've been doing recently with the MSI R9390X Gaming 8G. I'm working on that in a future video, so don't forget to subscribe if you want to stay tuned for that one. I also have some Fury X's in the pipeline, maybe some more work with the 980 Ti's, but I wanted to start this video off by saying a huge Thank you to those of you who gave me feedback and likes and even the dislikes on the last couple first five videos, one on motherboards and one on Windows installation. It is because of your feedback that I've decided to bring this series back and even several of you uh, actually asked for the one on GPUs and benchmarking. So that's where this one came from. Now I'm talking about GPUs here when it comes to uh, setting up for benchmarks, but this could really apply to CPUs or SSDs or any other component in your system that you might want to benchmark. As I was getting my list together for this video, I realized that these are more about preparing to benchmark but that's really important, setting up and preparing, because benchmarking can be very time consuming. So when you're preparing, you can help eliminate any pitfalls that might cause you to have to redo work later on, and that can save you a lot of time in the long run. But on with the show. Thing number one is to start with a plan, and since my focus was mainly on the R9-390X Gaming AG here from MSI, this kind of fell into place with how I arranged the rest of my benchmarking setup. Now, I actually haven't even plugged this video card in and started to benchmark it yet. You might notice that I have a 980 on the test bed right now, and then I also have a 970 here. That's because when I realized I was benchmarking the 390X, I wanted to plan to give some comparative benchmarks that were against other video cards in the price range, and the 970 is a little bit cheaper, the 980 is a little bit more expensive, the 390X falls right in the middle. So obviously this is a GPU, I'm going to be benchmarking some video games with it. But even beyond that, there's a bunch of other variables that can be involved. What resolution are you going to focus on, for, for example? Am I going to be doing 1080, 1440, or 4K, or some other resolution as well? Am I benchmarking one game, or am I benchmarking multiple games? Setting that stuff up at the beginning can really help you focus your efforts in order to save time in the long run. So to get your plan down from stage one, you should know what hardware you're going to be benchmarking, what software you're going to use to benchmark that hardware, and what your test bed configuration is going to be. Now, I have a set test bed right here. If you don't have that, you can use your computer at home, but keeping that test bed consistent throughout the testing is very important, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. Thing number two is to update everything before you start benchmarking. I cannot stress the importance of this. For instance, last night I went ahead and refreshed my Windows 8.1 installation on this test bed. I actually went for a from scratch installation and I did all the Windows updates and everything. If you do this frequently, it's definitely going to be, be worth your while to get Windows installation done, all the drivers installed, and then make an image using imaging software, using the built-in stuff within Windows to create something separate that you can load back onto that. The key element for getting consistent benchmarks over time with your test bed is to have it as clean as possible. You don't want other stuff gunking it up. So every so often, at least every month or so, you're probably going to want to refresh that operating system install to make sure that there's not too much other stuff going on. So after Windows is installed, run all your updates to make sure Windows update is updated because you don't want that kicking off and trying to run while you're running your benchmarks. And then you want to go ahead and get all your drivers updated. So chipset, of course. Key among the drivers you'll be installing is going to be your graphics card driver. So make sure you get the latest version from NVIDIA or from AMD's website. And uh, also keep an eye out for if a driver has launched recently. If it's been a while, say a month or two, or if there's an upcoming AAA game launch, for example, you might want to hold off and see if they're about to drop a new driver, nothing's more frustrated than running through a bunch of benchmarks with the existing graphics card driver and then a day or two later them launching a new GPU driver and you being like, well now my benchmarks are not irrelevant but they're a lot less relevant in that situation. Beyond the driver updates, you want to also make sure your software is updated properly. So that means all of the games, whether you have Steam installs or otherwise, just run each one first, make sure it's patched and up to date and that those are all good to go. The last thing I'll look at is my monitoring applications that I use. Uh, some popular lightweight ones are going to be CPU-Z as well as HW monitor or hardware monitor. Uh, you can also get GPU-Z and I run all three of those. Uh, there's other ones out there, so those are not the uh, end all and be all. IDA64 is another one that I like to throw out there. It's a little bit more uh, heavy, I'd say, than some of the, the basic monitoring programs. So just make sure you have those set up. You're going to want to monitor stuff while you're running the benchmarks. And you want those to be up to date as well. Thing number three is be consistent. How does one maintain consistency while benchmarking? 
Well, one great way to do this is to start out with a plan, like I mentioned in thing number one. So doing that, you're already kind of off to the right step. But there's some other things to keep in mind because you want to eliminate the possible variables as you're switching from one graphics card to another, or you're switching between, say, a standard setting as far as GPU frequency and an overclock setting. You want to make sure that the only variable between those two things is the graphics card that you're changing, for example. So for that reason, you don't want to go and be doing any crazy overclocking or changing your overclock settings in between benchmarks. If you are overclocking your test bed, make sure that overclock is engaged and make sure you've done some stability testing on that because that's another thing you don't want to do is run some benchmarks and then suddenly get a blue screen or something and you realize you've overclocked your CPU too much and then that might affect all your old benchmarks and they might have to go over and redo things. That's really what it's all about avoiding. Another way to maintain consistency is to run each benchmark at least three times. That's kind of the bare minimum standard. And if there's much variance between those three runs, then run them even more than that. Oftentimes people will run five times and then they'll throw out the highest and lowest numbers, uh, but three times is generally a good standard to go with. You can also do reality checking as you're running your benchmarks. So find someone else online who has run a similar benchmark configuration to you, see what tests they've run, and then see if you're getting numbers that are within the same general ballpark. Now granted, as I already mentioned, lots of little variables can affect benchmark numbers, but generally speaking, if I'm running, say for instance, a 5960X like I would be here versus a 5930K back there, that's not gonna affect it too hugely, but it's a good idea to go online and make sure that the numbers you're getting aren't too far below what the expected amount would be because that might mean that something's wrong. If you do encounter a situation where you don't feel like you're getting the right numbers, that's where you might go over and lean on your, uh, your benchmarking monitoring apps. You can see if the temperature's maybe too high. Reality checking is very important as you go along and don't just run benchmarks and run benchmarks until you come back to them later on and be like, oh, these numbers really aren't what they should be. Thing number four is a little bit out there, so bear with me here. I want you to go vertical or horizontal. Sounds, sounds exciting, right? But no, what I actually mean here is that you should focus. Focus what you're going to be benchmarking so that you don't spend too much time. Again, time is just, it's, it's a time suck. It will suck the time out of your life and it will give you nothing in return, except benchmark results, I suppose. But what do I mean by going vertical or going horizontal? Well, uh, the idea here is that if you're gonna be benchmarking, say, a 390X, and you wanna benchmark it against a bunch of other GPUs, like a 980 and a 970 and a 290X and whatever other graphics cards you're testing it against. And then you wanna also do each of those graphics cards with like seven, eight or nine different games, which is great. And people do that. So if you wanna save a little bit of your time, then going horizontal, I'm gonna say means testing a bunch of different graphics cards with one game. So you might say, here's my GTA 5 testing with a bunch of graphics cards and then people who are interested in GTA 5 tests can go and look at that. Going vertical, at least in this explanation, means you're testing maybe one GPU or maybe just a few, two or three at most, but you're testing that against a bunch of multiple games. Um, going for lots of games and lots of GPUs is just a recipe for sucking away two or three weeks of your life, which hey, if you got the time, then go for it. A lot of people do that and, and I like reading those articles, but for me, it, it's, that's too much time. And finally, thing number five is to give comparisons. I see lots of benchmarks posted online and uh, all they have is one set of benchmarks for the single card that they might be benchmarking, for example. Not that that's like completely useless, but without a frame of reference, it's hard to say that that's good or that's bad. You can look elsewhere online, you can do reality checking, for example, you can look at other benchmark sites that have benchmarked, but really you're the only person who can say for absolutely sure that you have neutralized all of the other variables so that you're giving a direct A to B comparison, um, especially if you've been following any of the advice from this video. So for that, exam for, for that reason, I will say always give at least one set of comparison benchmark numbers now, if you're in a situation where like, you're like, Paul, I've only got one graphics card. I don't have a set of them like you do. That's cool, and I understand. So maybe do something like run your graphics card at the stock speed that it comes out of the box, and then overclock it, and run the benchmarks with the overclock numbers. And you have like point A to point B comparison numbers, and that gives you at least something else to go with. Providing a baseline set of results so you can look at those numbers and say, ah, number B is higher than number A, and therefore number B is superior, makes the benchmarks just a lot more satisfying to look at. Now, the one last thing I'll point out here is that since you're running these benchmarks, and since I'm saying give a basis for comparison, uh, you should also set up some sort of logging mechanism. I like to use uh, Google Docs 
Just open up a spreadsheet there. You can make it as complex or as simple as you want, but it's a great way to keep things logged and then you can just go ahead and get a laptop or something, punch in those numbers as you run all of your benchmarks. And that is all. Those are my first five things for benchmarking uh, a GPU specifically, but of course applies to other things as well. I know there's other things out there too that might come to your mind when you're thinking about what are the first things that I think about when I'm about to do some benchmarking. So post those in the comment section down below. I'm sure there's going to be some people out there who are like, well, you didn't mention anything about like setting up to measure power draw, for example, or like getting a kilowatt or some other power measure measuring device to do that. You might uh, be a little bit more concerned about temperatures, maybe setting up instead of on a test bed inside of a case, doing something like that for more accurate results. Another extremely popular thing is just to unplug from the internet entirely while you run your benchmarks, which I do sometimes, but not always. But again, let me know in the comment section what you guys do or think about when you're setting up to run benchmarks on a graphics card. Thank you so much for watching this video. Don't forget to uh, subscribe for the upcoming videos on the 390X. Fury X is more benchmarks, more builds. I got all that stuff coming. Also, if you're interested, check out my store at store.paulshardware.net. I have my new shirts in stock available in three different colors and people seem to really enjoy them. They're very soft. People come up and touch me. But thank you guys for stopping by and checking out the latest in my first five video series. I'll have more in this series coming soon. And as always, thank you for watching.